Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. David and Julia Jerry wrote in the HarperCollins Dictionary of Sociology, quote, It is true that sociology is always, in one way or another, examining social change. It is also true to say that sociology itself was a child of social change. It is no coincidence that sociology emerged as a discipline when theorists attempted to understand the nature of the dramatic, social, economic, and political upheavals associated with the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries in European societies." Close quote. Lisa McIntyre wrote in her introductory sociology text, The Practical Skeptic, Core Concepts in Sociology, quote, As I sit down to write about culture, I feel like an ant trying to describe an elephant. The first thing that must be said about culture is that it's big. But my task is more difficult than the ants. An ant can turn away from the elephant and not see it. I cannot escape from culture. It surrounds me. It's inside of me. And I take it wherever I go. Close quote. Stephen Duncan wrote in the introduction to Cultural Resistance Reader, Quote, the very word culture is elastic. Here I'm referring to culture as a thing. There as a set of norms, behaviors, and ways to make sense of the world. And in still other places, I'm describing culture as a process. The term cultural resistance is no firmer. I use it to describe culture that is used, consciously or unconsciously, effectively or not, to resist and or change the dominant political, economic, and or social structure. But cultural resistance, too, can mean many things and take on many forms. Close quote. During the recent Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival, the Victoria Film Producers Association, also known as VIFPA, hosted a panel of local documentary filmmakers representing six films to discuss how documentaries lead to social change. Moderated by Don Hill, former host of CBC Radio 1's Tapestry and a filmmaker in his own right, the panel showcased their six films and discussed the roles that documentary played in social activism. VIFPA graciously allowed us to tape the session. In addition to attending the panel, we spoke with Cher Morgan, co-producer, co-writer, and director of Silence of the Strings, a documentary of the story of Victoria young people who have fought to maintain their string orchestra program. To help us make sense of what we learned, we returned to the interview we did with Diane Searle, executive director of MediaNet. Interviewing these talented Victorians, attending and recording the VIFPA panel session, and indeed going to the Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival, led us to think about the role of documentaries in culture. This week on First Person Plural, we ask what a documentary film has to do to lead to social change. In an episode we call, Lights, Camera, Social Action. 
I keep thinking about how does culture get produced that gives a structure or a framework to the way that we thought about this panel discussion and really the way that we thought about the films that we saw and the people that we met during the whole film festival. The idea of repetition, repetition, repetition. I think that to a certain extent, people become comfortable with that which is repeated. I think it points out that culture and cultural production is often a departure from the rational. You shouldn't have to say something more than once if reason holds sway. But more often than not, people remember things they hear more than once and forget things they don't hear more than once. That's not true to the exclusion of all other principles but it's a strong tendency. I See, I regard culture as a fantastic invention. And I think of it as an invention, even though we're born into it and we don't actually get to invent it from scratch. But in a sense, it's handed to us. And in a sense, we repeat it and replicate it and change it and reinvent it constantly. And because of that, we don't have to rethink things every day of our lives. That repetition, that comfortable level of knowing what to expect is a nice invention from the point of view of not having to start from scratch every single day of your life. If you had to do that, then you couldn't ever walk into a classroom or go to a place of business or drive down the street I mean, we'd all be paralyzed because we wouldn't know what to do in each situation that we encounter. So in one sense, having cultural expectations is an incredible saving in time and effort. It's an extremely efficient model in a lot of ways. As long as it's not overdone. And that's the problem. When culture starts getting stagnant, when this repetition is never reflected upon, thought about, fixed, or monkeyed with, I think that it becomes stale and it becomes tyrannical. Maybe that's the best word. So let's explain our little format, our idea for this week's show before we go to the first clip. Sure. We attended the Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival, and specifically the Changing Image Forum, which was put on by the Victoria Film Producers Association. There were a number of filmmakers on hand, and there were excerpts from six of their films. These were all local Victoria filmmakers. That's right. It was a sort of combination panel discussion and preview extravaganza. Their format was to alternate previews and panel discussion, previews and panel discussion. They very generously allowed us to tape the entire event. And we did a reasonably good job of it, too. Considering that it was in a small theater with absolutely no PA system, it was all right. We'll be playing a number of clips from that and from an interview we did with one of the participants later on by telephone. Yes, we interviewed Cher Morgan, who is... Co-producer, co-writer, and director. Yes. Of Silence of the Strings. And she very sweetly talked to us by phone a couple of days after the event and kind of fleshed out some ideas for us. And then we also went back and looked at an interview we did a couple of weeks ago with Diane Cyril, who is the executive director of MediaNet, because she had some things to say, and specifically we pulled one clip out that helped us kind of frame a lot of our thinking as we listened in on this panel and began to think about it sociologically. We'll be telling you as we play the clips who said what, so you don't need to learn to recognize the voices. So let's play the first clip, which is actually from the phone interview with Cher Morgan. And I think that that's how some of the best stories that are made begin. They're universal stories, but they have a, a very human face or a very personal face or interpretation. I think that one of the ways in which documentaries work is that they do tell stories. We think of stories as being narratives of fiction, but in fact, I think documentaries go out and find information about real human beings and in some ways tell stories that kind of touch us 
maybe even more than a good fiction would. One of the principles behind narrative analysis is that there's no a priori distinction between fiction and nonfiction, and if there were, we wouldn't recognize it. It's all just text. It's all just made-up stories. Of course, you can ground your story in, quote, reality, close quote, to whatever extent you want. But from the reader's standpoint, he doesn't know how accurate it is and how many liberties you're taking. But with a film, there are certain codings that say this is real. And that doesn't mean that, I mean, everybody who's ever seen Spinal Tap knows that you can make a fake documentary that looks real. But that's the idea. You're supposed to recognize that movie in particular as being a satire of that sort of movie. And satire depends upon that recognition of the modality. And sarcasm depends on recognition of modality. So how do you see human stories as being part of producing culture? I think a story necessarily puts in certain things and leaves out certain things. We all, with our perceptions, note what we find relevant and dismiss what we find irrelevant. And a story is a way of, well, can be a way of indicating to someone else what we find relevant about a particular situation. We can't know the story of a human being without knowing the culture. In other words, when somebody tells a story in a language I don't understand of a human being, there are going to be things that I recognize in the story because I'm human and they're human that I can pick up on. But I won't pick up on everything. I mean, remember when we were watching Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Remember that movie? Sure. And we saw it in Winnipeg, and we were the only Americans and the only people from the Southeast United States, which is where the movie is set, and the entire theater. Well, we don't know that, but... We suspected it. We strongly suspected it. <laughs> and we may have been the only people who also understood uh, the Odyssey, or at least understood it well enough to see the the irony of using it in a story about the Southeast. And we were laughing, and nobody else laughed. I mean, we were laughing at the jokes in the movie. So there are things that you miss. Culture gives context to the human story. And if you don't have that cultural basis when you're telling the human story that Cher is talking about, you may not understand the story or understand. You know, the, the in other words, the filmmakers were lying to a certain extent upon culture in order to be able to tell the story of the person. We also have another clip by her in the same phone interview, and let's listen to that, and then we'll talk about that a bit. One of the other powerful things about documentary film, especially ones about social change or social movements, is that as soon as you walk into a public sphere with a camera, it becomes an affirmative act to the people that are there uh, that are being filmed or the people who care about that, and so they go, oh, yeah, this must matter because somebody's bothering to make a film about it. Whether it matters is whether it's important to the person telling the story or to the person listening to the story. And that's what narrative is. It takes the unbelievable complexity of human experience and boils it down. The person who does the boiling or the persons who do the boiling are irretrievably a part of the process. It's what they pick out and what they leave behind that makes up the narrative. And this can be distortion, and it always is, but it can also be very convenient. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every day when you get up first thing. The telling of the story, that is the turning on of the camera, changes the story. These people are going about their business doing what they're doing, and they reflect upon it when the camera is turned on and begin to affirm the fact that what they are doing matters. And so she's actually talking about how the telling of the story changes the story. The camera becomes a part of the story at that point. And you can't get away from that. I mean, a lot of people talk about documentary as if it's truthful and as if it is merely this passive thing that's observing the thing that would have happened anyway. But the truth of the matter is, just by virtue of turning the camera on and putting the camera's gaze on something, makes that thing matter, makes that thing change. How about if it were hidden video? That's becoming popular nowadays. I guess the video would still be contextualized, and that's the real issue here, that the conditions were such that a camera could be hidden right away contextualizes it. 
Yeah, I would say that affects the angle of the camera, which affects how the story is being told. It also, and you know, where the camera is, I mean, you've, we've all seen 60 minutes hidden cameras going in to places and you're basically looking at the feet of people or something like that, which changes the story somewhat. But the other thing I would suggest is that once the film is aired, it changes culture as well. That once somebody knows that the camera had been placed upon him, he's going to tell a different story about the event than he would have if he hadn't known about the camera. And culture happens in the stories that we tell about the past. I mean, Foucault talks about that. He says that history is always the history of the present. And what he means is that we know history through the stories that we tell. So even if the camera is hidden, it eventually changes the story. Because once somebody finds out that the camera is hidden, they change their story. I think that that makes documentary filmmaking a little more difficult to analyze because the word documentary implies that it's documenting culture. But most of the people that we saw in the film festival who made documentaries and we talked to and, and watched their films were about making social change. They were about not just producing a documentation of what existed, but they were also about creating new culture. That is, making changes in the culture. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Let's go ahead and listen to another filmmaker. Uh, Don Hill was the moderator of the panel, and Martin DeVolk is the producer and director on the film A Forgotten Legacy, which took a look at the ways in which natives produce labor in British Columbia. And let's listen, and then we'll talk about it. I think what it came down to is I came across some information about native labor in D.C., and when I went to look further, there was none. There was absolutely no book. There's just no material out there. So but you're not First Nation. You're not I'm not, I've, but I've worked with, in the last 10 years, I've done five different films with the First Nation. So with that in mind, uh, about there's no information that intrigued me. So you were not only intrigued, you picked up a camera, got together the tools to, to have an outcome. Not all documentaries claim to be objective or attempt to be objective or succeed in being objective if that's what they're out to do in the first place. A lot of times the documentary maker is very much a participant, is very much aware of his influence, and in fact tries to increase or direct his influence. He told the story because nobody else had. That he was interested in a topic and he looked around and he found that nobody had actually documented it. And I think that's a very interesting reason for telling a story. Yeah, I think it's quintessential field research. The quintessential rationale for field research is that if you don't go out and find it, no one will have found it. And I think that that points out that this style of documentary filmmaking is a type of sociology. I think so. And I think that it also demonstrates that it's a type of of oral history, that What he's saying is that if I don't go out and document this right now, while there are still people around that I can go interview and talk to, it will get lost. It won't be there anymore. And that brings up the question, why do some stories survive and why do others not? And that becomes a question of power. And I think that that's very obvious when you're talking about why do native stories not make it? into the discourse, into the mainstream discourse. Well, yeah, there's an element of materialism to it. Um, Certain cultures get attritioned out because the people who would support them are, well, if not killed outright, then denied access to the means of cultural production. At least they are not allowed that access to the extent that certain other people are. 
who would and do reproduce other cultures. If you were to talk to most people and ask them how do they know about the world around them, you know, people outside their local circle, they would respond, I know because CNN told me or CBC told me or whoever. I find that disheartening and a little scary and very revealing. That was the theme that got hit by Don Hill quite a bit during the panel discussion. Why is this stuff not on television more often? Here are these six wonderful films, and there are certainly hundreds more that are being made that are telling important stories about the world. And instead, we get to hear George W.'s latest tape loop, in which he basically is saying the same thing that he said last week just about this time, so that we can all sit and fear a little bit more, so that he can, you know, work towards whatever it is that he's working towards. Invariably, the nightly news has to leave something out. It's only on for 30 minutes a day. But one might learn something from noting what gets left out. In newspapers, they call it the news hole. The news hole is the size of column inches that are left over after all of the advertising has been sold out. The thing that determines how big your newspaper is is how many ads have been sold. And after the advertising is placed in, then there are certain things that are put in every time, like the crossword puzzle, you know, the advice columns, the astrology, and the comics. And then when all is said and done, then they put the news in, which is really ironic since the thing is called newspaper. How much news gets reported is very much determined by what's left over. Then you get into, well, how do I decide what to put in there and what not? And the chances are you're going to decide that on the basis of what will keep all of these people who bought these ads happy. I guess uh, this is a good segue because we're talking about advertisers and the newspapers and so forth. And part of what's going on in film today has to do with how it is becoming more democratized in terms of being able to afford to make a film. The new technologies are allowing more people access to more equipment to make better quality films because I can take my little handheld Canon camera everywhere I want to go now, including other countries, including just driving around town or whatever, and I can take pictures of things that are fairly good quality that could, in fact, rival film quality, depending upon the conditions under which I film and how competent I am with the little camera. It means that if something's important to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be important to anybody else. I just have to point my camera at it. And I don't have to get a film crew out, and I don't have to be intrusive with a large camera and a lot of lights and all of the stuff that you had to do before to do film. Let's go ahead and listen to another filmmaker, Bill Weaver, who did the film From New Age to New Edge. He was the producer and director. Uh, let's listen to him talk about a little bit about this new technology. We all have to give a little bit away. Uh, we're all competitors in a certain way, but we're really into the same synergy. And we help one another a lot. We show up in one another's credits. We help one another's films. We can do the and lend people videotapes. So that type of a film community, a true film community, is necessary to the existence of film. I think it's interesting. One of the things that we discovered during the film festival, we're talking a lot about community here, is that the filmmaker community is very strong in Victoria among the documentary filmmakers. They are, in fact, working on each other's films. Uh, I think Sherry mentioned that Bill grabbed his camera and came out with her the first thing that she filmed for her film, which was a meeting that was taking place on a certain day. She talked about this not during the, the uh, VIFPA session, but she talked about this with you, 
in the interview that she did with you a couple of weeks ago. And here she was knowing that this event was going to happen, having no idea whether she was really going to be able to make the documentary that she was getting ready to make and having no funding yet. But she knew somebody who had a camera who could do what she needed to do and she gave him a call and he came out for the day and did it. And that's the kind of cooperation that goes on amongst the filmmakers. And they do this formally and informally. Bill Weaver coined the term coopetition to describe this sort of environment. On one hand, they are competitors. They're doing the same thing. And if one of them is making a film for money, the others may or may not share in the revenue, depending on how that particular filmmaker feels about it in the particular case. On the other hand, some local cooperation is inevitable, if only from a standpoint of enlightened self-interest. If they don't cooperate at all, then localities where the filmmakers do cooperate somewhat may well outcompete them. And it's unsurprising that a town in which the filmmakers are trying to compete with the established industries in Vancouver and Toronto would want to cooperate on certain economies of scale. And create a bit of a haven. I mean, you're talking about this economically, but I think we're also talking about the emotionality of it, the connectiveness of it. One of the things that makes this area appealing is that cooperation aspect of it. So it becomes a reasonable thing to do from a marketing point of view, and it becomes an emotionally satisfying thing to do as you are working through all of the things that you have to work through in order to be a filmmaker. I think that part of what's going on here is that these are people who care about community. That's part of what their work is about. That's part of what, I mean, they're trying to create social change. They're interested in changing the world around them. And so I think that it becomes part of their identity to be willing to share with each other. I think that there's a much greater social process going on here than simply greater returns. Or another way to put it might be that part of the greater returns is not material. So it'll be pointless to search for other models while simultaneously reifying the dominant one. Exactly. And so it's a way in which they live what they do. And I, and I was impressed with that during the film festival. It seemed that these are activists who are active in the causes that they document. And they make no secret of it. Before we get too far into this, though, I want us to consider how the cheaper technology is making this all possible. In other words, if there was this little money and it still cost quite a bit to make a film, to start the process of making a film, I'm not sure that that cooperation would be as easy to obtain as it is. It's an interesting time because I think that the new technologies are making it possible, or at least making it easier to have that sense of community. Let's listen as Peter Campbell talks about the new technology. Campbell did the movie Sherry Kingsley, recognizing the person. It almost harkens back to the availability of relatively inexpensive equipment. Yeah. You know, you can just sort of grab a couple of cases and go out and shoot. Um, so you've invested a day. If nothing happens uh, with it, fine. But often you find yourself with uh, some gems that you wouldn't in the past have had an opportunity to, to go and shoot. Here you can go out and take your camera out for a day. You can catch some really interesting things that may or may not turn into a film, but become part of your stock. And it might not become part of a film that you do, but if you're part of this community, it might become part of a film that somebody else does. And so a lot of things are getting captured that used to not be captured because it doesn't require you to put together a crew. It doesn't require you to have huge, expensive cameras around. It just requires you to know what's going on in your neighborhood. You don't have to make every shot count the way you do when you're filming, mm -hmm. if you use videotape. And the reason is simply cost. Cost and storage. A mini DV tape 
doesn't take up a lot of space sitting on your shelf waiting to be seen by somebody and it certainly takes up some of your hard drive but you know hard drives are getting cheaper too as are other kinds of storage cds dvds so forth so the next clip is Diane Searle from her interview with you a couple of weeks ago, and she sums up what we've been talking about very, very well. Uh, it means that anyone basically with very little financial resources can now come and find a way to join Medianet or Cinebic and have equipment for little or no cost. They can pay for their tapes and they can make some things can be made for, for very little cost and that wasn't the way that it was at all when it was just film as an option. So what it means is work can be made without having to go through the, the fairly strict and in terms of drama, say I you know, write a script, get funding for, for a script from you know, the certain places that fund scripts and then go out and get funding for the shoot and, you know, carry on kind of step by step, but needing funding agencies because you just can't make enough money to, uh, you know, to make the film yourself any other way. And that has now changed so that someone can make a film fairly inexpensively. It can also be a more experimentally oriented film because you can do things with video that you can't do uh, very easily in, in, in film in a lot of ways and certainly not for low cost. You can go and get funding after the fact. So, you might have a, a way of working that doesn't sell well on paper but would be incredible visually and you would have an opportunity to actually make that film and try and, and try and have it funded after the fact and then transferred to film for a theatrical release. So uh, the expense is changing what is being made. A much more organic process is possible because many people can own or have frequent access to their own equipment. We're going to play two clips now, both of them from Cher Morgan. The first one is part of her phone interview, and the second one was uh, her discussion at the panel. <laughs> 
the people that come in as your production partners, they become part of that affirmative action too. I mean, I make a point of going back to our production partners as soon as there's any good news. Because sure, there may be bureaucrats in Ottawa that, that took a chance on this little tiny story based in Victoria. So uh, whenever we go out and there's a positive or any kind of response to it, then I go back to our production partners just to remind them, thank you for making that choice. I think that filmmakers are storytellers, and I think that part of our drive is to tell stories. The proximity that it takes you to a subject, richness in your life. Documentary films are different than other films. Documentary filmmakers are different than other films. I'm not sure that I have the right to say, um, gee, I want to tell a story, so I deserve to make this film. We're talking all about this process, and we're talking about it on a local level. But Shara has offered another layer to this. At some point, you do have to get funding. At some point, you do work your way out into production, and production does start getting expensive, especially when you want to actually distribute what you're producing. So you do go out, you do find funders, and we're not going to get into the complicated funding system that exists in the world of film. It would be a whole other episode. The community model on the local level and shares discourse gets built outward. So if she's relying upon funders in Vancouver or Ottawa, she still thinks of them as part of her community. And so the concept that she has that as an activist, she is including these funders in her activism shows up in a way that she talks about this. The whole reason that I wanted to interview her after the panel was over was because of that last clip and her comment that she didn't feel like she had a right to expect a living from documentary filmmaking. That certainly was not the way that the other filmmakers talked about it, but she wasn't talking about not being sustainable. I think she definitely wants to maintain her lifestyle and she certainly wants to keep her activism going. But what she's saying is that it's not like a commercial enterprise. And I think that that is reflected in the approach that most of these documentary filmmakers took to their efforts, including the way they thought about the community. This next clip is from Arthur Holbrook and Hilary Jones Farrow. They were co-producers on the movie To Free the Slaves, and they discuss in the first clip with Don Hill why they decided to make this movie. Well, in this particular case with the slavery film, I've been studying the issue for quite a long time. We were in an excellent position to learn a lot about and it. And if you didn't do it, nobody else would. Well, actually, there's an English filmmaker who did a similar film. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about abolitionists. It's not about abolitionists. focus on the problem, and, and we wanted to focus on the people who were working to solve the problem. In the second clip, Holbrook talks about the distribution of the film. I was just going to say, there's a, one of the other audiences for... Uh, in the case of our slavery film, was through some of the organizations that we worked with. Uh, in, ev in each of the examples we used in the film, they were people who, you know, these were the abolitionists, were pretty secondary to them. They're the people in the front line. In one case, uh, Save the Children of Canada, for example, took up the film uh, the night of the broadcast on Vision. They showed it in about 10 locations across the country. They've taken that as part of their uh, slavery and chocolate campaign in Mali. So there are other audiences as well that we get some feedback that we're doing something. They wanted to make a film about the abolitionists. They wanted to make something positive. They weren't just reliant upon it being on a broadcast, which it was. It was shown on television. But they also were distributing it for the organizations that they filmed about. And this becomes a very complicated relationship between the documentary film and the subject of the documentary film. They made a film about the organizations that were doing abolitionist work, and the organizations in turn used it to further their work. So the distribution channel is a complicated social channel. And one that the activist can't reasonably ignore. So this brings us to distribution, and I think that that's where it gets sticky. We're talking about the democratization of filmmaking and how wonderful it is that it's not expensive anymore and we're all capable of doing a film and taking our little video camera out or borrowing a video camera out for a day, and then it hits this big bottleneck 
Just when you've got control of the means of production, you find out that the means of distribution are important too. They are almost singularly important in this field. This next clip is Cher Morgan talking about how television works. And she talks about the box, and she doesn't necessarily mean the TV box. So let's listen in. Almost every film that's made is in distribution or becomes available some way for people within communities to sit down together and watch it. Sometimes when we watch things on television, we're sitting in our own boxes watching a box. And we don't end up talking with anybody about what we can do. So go ahead and ask the library to order any film that you see, and it's probably in distribution, and then sit down with other people and watch it together and talk and move and act. So we're sitting in a box watching a box. And I love that she brings the library in at this point because the library is a means of distribution that a lot of people don't think about. But it's also a place where a lot of obscure films are put. A lot of documentary films end up in the library. She talks about a little bit later in this session about how she had all of her friends throughout Canada call up their local libraries and request her film. And I thought that that was absolutely brilliant on her part. What better way to get your film distributed? Here's something that doesn't, I mean, most libraries will respond. If you put a request in, they have a budget and they go out and they buy the films that you request. And so if you get all your friends to do that, then here in every community throughout Canada, the film is now available. And when someone says to you, well, how can I get a hold of your film? You say, go to the local library. It's right there. It's available. You can take it and play it for whatever group or however you want to put it together. It surprises me that libraries are as prevalent as they are, public libraries, and at the same time they are unmarked in public discourse as sources of media distribution. People talk about them, but they don't seem to understand how big a factor they still are even in this day and age. And they're becoming even bigger because a lot of their stuff is available online. And I would love to see, I mean, one of the ways that I can think of to solve this distribution problem that was discussed uh, pretty fully at the panel would be to create an archive. And what better way to create an archive than to supply digital versions of these things to libraries where they can place them online. Uh, this next clip is Bill Weaver, and he talks about in this clip what he thinks the problems are, and we kind of disagree with him. We think that he marks the wrong thing in this clip. So we'll let you listen in, and then we'll talk about it. Now what's happening is we have a hundreds of digital channels splitting the already dwindling viewership as it is who are already burnt out on TV and can't find anything on it. License fees are, are lower, and because there are young filmmakers who are willing to do something for practically nothing, sure. the first peak of your film is great. It's working off of all your enthusiasm, and, 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 and then you can get your film into the, in the, in the broadcaster relatively cheaply. The broadcaster loves that. Now try to make your second one. Uh, because there's a whole other line of very enthusiastic people ready to do this for nothing practically, you know, waiting at the door. Weaver gives an analysis here that I thought was um, fairly typical and part of the problem. He's taking a look at the distribution channel as if it cannot change, as if it is totally market driven and that there is no politics involved in what gets put on the air and what doesn't. And so instead of confronting the question, why is it that there are 157 channels now available on Shaw and all of them are playing the same thing, he confronts it from the point of view of too much on the market. I thought that he was not getting the fact that it's jammed up and not getting the fact that there's a politics to that jamming up. He unmarked the big thing in the room. He missed the elephant sitting right in front of him. It did seem strange that he looked at it as a zero-sum game. I really don't know why he would do that, and I think that in the context of the expanding video distribution channels, the new digital channels being only one of these channels, pardon me for the linguistic fallacy, 
it seems that that would be just the area in which he would realize that it was not a zero-sum game. I think that that's because we all live within culture. And so here's somebody who's very active historian, and, and he sort of ran into the cultural wall in his analysis of the situation. What I would suggest is that, in fact, what needs to be done is to break down that, that wall that we need to find some ways to get access to these channels. And it's going to be a difficult task because, because of the oligopoly, because of our favorite topic about media. And that's where it's being held up. The production is possible, but the distribution is not, because the means of distribution are controlled by a very few hands, even in Canada. Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. The next clip is uh, Martin DeVock again talking about his relationship with APTN and I think that this is interesting because APTN funded and uh, helped him produce his film and yet he still ran into distribution difficulties. Has it been a struggle to get this particular film broadcast? Uh, no, I mean APTN was on board but beyond that it's hard to get a broadcast. Why? That's a good question. Um, maybe it's just not the material, it's just not, or it's just not like Bill said, it's not a big punch. It's good material, it's interesting material, but it's not crises involved or there's no conspiracy or whatever. So this is interesting here. APTN helped him put the film together, helped him produce it, gave him a means of distribution, but it also marks it as an aboriginal film and it kind of sticks it in a certain distribution channel. The problem of distribution becomes complex at that point. It isn't just a matter of finding one broadcaster, it's a matter of where you place it as to whether the message will get out or not. It's always a double-edged sword when somebody with a certain amount of power takes interest in what you're doing if you're an activist. Uh, I've heard about the National Film Board that they're the same sort of double-edged sword. On one hand, one is very grateful for their help when one is making a film. A number of people with whom we spoke during the festival who'd gotten help from the NFB told us that they had been saved by the NFB. On the other hand, to the extent that a film is accepted by the status quo, does that compromise its activist quotient? The last clip that we're going to play, uh, I think, kind of sums up for us our feelings about the distribution process. And this is Don Hill talking. When we look across our broadcast spectrum and our newspapers and media generally, we have an illusion of choice, but an epidemic of sameness. So that's it in a nutshell almost, that there's this illusion of choice, but in the end, because of the distribution channels being jammed, that choice doesn't quite exist. I mean, anybody who's flipped through television lately feels that, and certainly anybody who's read a newspaper in Canada feels it. There does seem to be a narrowing of scope, even as the distribution channels increase in number. The spread seems not to have improved that much. Yeah, it's very scary when you think about it. And I think that this didn't get addressed directly by the panel, but I was left walking away going, okay, here's something that I've identified as a place for social change. And it's very frustrating because it's, it's one of the hardest places to work for change. And it brought me back to this whole idea of the politics of culture. It didn't get marked in the session, but what I walked away with is, oh my God, culture still is being controlled 
not by these great documentary filmmakers, but by the distribution channels of getting these films out. And there are lots of ways of subverting it. I mean, the library idea was great. Uh, some of the other ideas that were discussed was uh, using community groups. And there are social change festivals showing up all over the place uh, where, you know, these films are produced and a lot of people who are interested in these issues get to go to the festival and watch the films. And there's something to be said for preaching to the choir. I mean, a lot of, one of the recurring themes was it's good to make documentaries that help support and make people feel good about their activism. But I don't think that's enough. And I had a feeling from these filmmakers that it really wasn't enough for them either. That it was comforting and and good, but it wasn't enough. So we're, we're right up against this frustration. And you said something to me the other day that I thought was very interesting, and that is... I think the remark to which you're referring is, quote, if the mere action is a threat to the existing power structure, one asks why, close quote. So why are these films not being distributed? And I think it's because the mere act of making them is threatening. I can't decide which way to come down on this one. On one hand, the CRTC sees to it that channels that want to be widely distributed have to have more than a little contribution to the public good. And you'd think with enough specialty channels out there, even the ones that aren't contributing as much, the Tier 2 channels are called, would be enough of a niche that they would actually be more conducive to specialty programming. On the other hand, I have this fear that all cable channels are becoming the same. Yeah, the empirical evidence doesn't seem to support the CRTC's hope and dreams, does it? And indeed, it seems to be gravitating in the other direction. The new digital channels, so-called, have been around for about two years now, but I really don't see that much of a spread in the discursive realms. I see, if anything, more reification of the status quo. Maybe that's just my particular taste. Maybe it's not. I think what I see here is this is analogous to all of the people in the world who recycle, but very few people in the world buy the recycled goods. And, you know, Joanne Woodward gets on American TV and talks about completing the circle. I think that if documentary filmmaking and especially filmmaking aimed at social change, which we've concentrated on documentary, but that can also include experimental film and drama film and so forth and certainly comedy. There's a lot of comedy out there that's aimed at social change. But for film to produce social change, it needs not only a movement towards production, but it needs a movement for the demand for consumption. It needs people who are willing to say, I want to see this kind of programming. It's nice if everyone can have his own camcorder, but if everyone only wants to watch the Hollywood productions, then it's immaterial if you have your own camcorder. Nobody's going to watch your film. And that could have serious, even terminal, implications for the film industry throughout Canada, not just in Victoria. And especially for the film industry that's interested in producing new kinds of culture. We'd like to thank the Victoria Independent Film and Video Festival, the British Columbia Office of the National Film Board of Canada, and the Victoria Film Producers Association for helping us to explore documentary filmmaking for this episode. We are especially grateful to the filmmakers who participated in VIFPA's The Changing Image panel discussion on documentary films and social change. They are Don Hill, former host of CBC Radio 1's Tapestry and moderator of the panel. Peter C. Campbell, producer of Sherry Kingsley, recognizing the person. Martin DeVolk, producer-director of A Forgotten Legacy. Arthur Holbrook, 
co-producer of To Free the Slaves. Hillary Jones Farrow, co-producer and director of To Free the Slaves. Sherry LePage, director of From Baghdad to Peace Country and co-producer and co-writer of Silence of the Strings. Cher Morgan, director, co-producer, and co-writer of Silence of the Strings. Bill Weaver, producer-director of From New Age to New Edge. Finally, we'd like to thank Diane Searle, executive director of MediaNet, for her support. If you would like to know more about the organizations or films mentioned on this show, please visit our website, fpp.culturalconstructioncompany.com. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. 